Okay, so watch your mouths. <laughs> so how do you want to do this, Cindy, with Caspian? Um, what are you comfortable with, Caspian? Uh, I listened to the recording of the questions that you all had asked or topics that you had broached from the last time, but I don't really know where to start. So uh, if one of you just wants to start asking questions and I'll see what I can do. Deirdre's the questioner. Okay. So um, my grandfather uh, emigrated from Switzerland, but he was born in France and it's become apparent that this little Swiss village where he and his relatives are from, that a lot of them would go to France. I don't know if they live there seasonally or temporarily. Um, you know, I'm sure it was an employment may, I, I don't know. Um, but his father was a railroad worker and, you know, their little village in Switzerland, uh, freezing cold for, you know, the majority of the year, very small, no work. I mean, I can understand why they maybe moved for employment, but why did they all go to France? And then of course, you know, if, if you're young and single, like my great, great grandfather was, great, great grandfather, he married, oh, we fed you, Cindy, we saw you. Cindy, do whatever you did. There, there. Okay. <laughs> what was it? There, there's like a, except for I'm not, I, there's like a little ledge thing I was feeling. <laughs> See, trust my sense of touch. <laughs> and I felt this little edge and I went, oh, this moves. <laughs> yeah, there we go. that's why I said, no, touch it. it, touch it, Cindy, touch it. I, okay, <laughs> now I know that's my sense of touch. No, really, truly. <laughs> but I had put myself, because I was trying to do things and I was at, um, under the video images, wait a minute. Is she done? I don't know. No. Okay. Don't and touch anything. No, I I'll can't see. You. I can't see me. We can see you. <laughs> well, good. And I can't <laughs> see me. I'm not there because I touched something. Oh, now I'm there, sort of. But but not on the screen. Okay, hold on just a minute. Get my magnifier. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Share screen. Recording. Statistics, feedback. Ah, oh, shoot. Because I did a thing. Let's play. I can still talk over you though, right, Cindy? Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I don't know, maybe like some kind of work program, visa pro work program, you know, but I don't know why they chose to go to France because they're really from the Italian speaking section, you know, as opposed to Germany or Italy, they could have, they're really the Swiss Italian, you know, not that many people speak French in that village. So um, if anything, I feel like more speak German. So I don't get it. And there had to have been a reason. Well, from what I, I noted down the year 1905, which might've just been you had mentioned the period around nine, the, the first decade of the 20th century. Yes, my grandfather was born in Paris in 1905. He was born in 1905, okay. Um, I had found that in 1905, in that time period in Paris, there was a huge building project going on the subway. <laughs> Paris did not, Develop, uh, start building subways until relatively late among the European cities. Uh, and that was right when they were busy tunneling under the city, uh, building the subway network, which of course requires a lot of railway work. Oh my gosh. That's so awesome, Caspian. No, I can't 
I don't know whether this is what he was actually doing, um, but that's my best guess for a major project that he might have been working on. Um, but at the time, this is pre World War One Paris. There's a lot of money going around, a lot of rebuilding, um, a lot of investment. He would not have been working on the Eiffel Tower that was about a generation before, but the Paris subway system was a huge project. And today I think it's the most dense subway network in the world. Like the distance between stations is very, very close. So probably required a lot of work. Oh. On top of that, I don't think they could do what what you normally do with subway construction today, where you dig a big hole, build what you build, and then cover it up again. Um, I, I think in Paris they were having to tunnel, which is significantly more difficult. So they probably required a lot of labor just to dig those tunnels and then from there uh, build the network. Well, that's very interesting because uh, the little village where he's from is uh, the San Gotard Tunnel. Um, thanks. I was going to show you, uh, it, which is a, a very important um, tunnel through the mountains in Switzerland. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm looking my, my Swiss San Gotard pencil box. Um, yeah, from 1872 to 1882. So they did have that um, experience. I, I, I think that's probably really it. I think you, you figured it out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, so, so who's next? <laughs> and, and keep in mind that if other things occur to you, as Caspian's talking about some other part of your family or some other story you heard, you could try it out. I mean, he may he may know the answer, even though he hasn't any research on it. He's hearing about it for the first time. You don't know who wants to go next. Well, I think there's a general thing that that I'm trying to figure out, and that's the whole Hungarian, Austrian Hungarian. Uh, borders and the shifts and, and all that area there, and especially focusing on the 1800s. And I don't know, Mary, is your whole people in that part too? Um, Austria Hungary, yeah. Yeah. Um, my um, grandmother and grandfather immigrated in the early 1900s from Austria Hungary, which is now known as uh, Bergenland. Austria. So um, my grandfather was from, from what <clears throat> living relatives know from actually near the tip of Italy. And there are a lot of German speaking uh, people still that are in uh, Northern Italy. And then um, there's more history on my grandfather, but my grandmother um, came from the territory that's now known as Czechoslovakia and that's what I'm told but yeah I still haven't been able to find really any other information on her because her parents were deceased and then she went and worked in Vienna to um, make her way to this country so and I have um, somebody who came over somewhere around 1860 who depending on which census you look at, um, says she's from Austria, says she's from Hungary, says, Hungary, says she's from Prussia, says she's from Venice. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Venice yeah. or Vienna? Oh, thank you, Vienna. Yeah, yeah. The, my family has the same kind of thing being from uh, Slovenia from supposedly I guess the Lubricana kind of somewhere in that area that depending on which document you're looking at when they came over, it would say they were from Yugoslavia or with a J or it would say Austria-Hungary or I think I've seen documents that say Prussia 
Um, and I, you guys already know the story. I already told you how Caspian told me about the military in that time and how um, they they um, had many languages because they were so close to each border and the borders I think kept moving and stuff. So so I'd also be interested in that time period. My, my time period would be 1880s when they came to America or 1890s. So before that, obviously, when my family, my ancestors would have been directly still there. So I guess Cassie, that might be a kind of a general question, kind of a give us some background on the history of that era so we can kind of see how it relates to our own family. Okay. Um... If it's okay, I'm going to share my screen. Sure. I I'm taking notes. That. Okay, can you all see that? Oh, geez, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, we can't being able read the to read it, <laughs> not so important in this case. Okay. But this is a linguistic map of the Austro-Hungarian of the Austrian Empire as of 1855, I believe. So basically what you can see is, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This red region here, that is basically today's Austria. They speak German here. You can see they speak German up here. This greenish, light green area is today's Czech Republic up in the north and Slovakia down here. Um, I don't know how it's marked on the map because can there you, are- Can you give us a bigger context, Caspian? Where's Italy on there? Because I'm not sure the scale of this. Italy is down here. This yellow region is what they called the Kingdom of Lombardy, Venetia. And it is the region of Northern Italy that contains Venice down here on the Adriatic coast and Milan, which I think is this collection of lines. Um, it also contains this uh, heavily mountainous area of the uh, Alps um, that's known as the Tyrol. Um, and this white region right in the middle is Hungary. Those are the Hungarian speaking uh, portions. So you can see just what kind of a linguistic mix the empire was. Uh, you've got Slovenian-speaking regions here, along with a tiny little German region. Um, you've got Croatian all along this V. Over here, I believe, is uh, Romania. This is Transylvania and would later become part of Romania. This area is going to be Polish up in the north and Ukrainian in the east. I'm looking at a map on another screen right now, the bigger map, like a Google map. And man, this is really condensed, right? It's which we're looking at on your screen, Caspian. It looks very tight. Well, today, this is this is a number of different countries, largely wow linguistically based um that became the biggest determinant of what became an individual country so several hundred years ago um austria was the domain of the habsburg family one branch of it they managed to gain control of a large chunk of hungary when the Hungarian kingdom was defeated in war with the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, which would be down to the south. Um, over time, the Habsburgs, who also controlled some other territory around here, kept adding and adding more. And when the Holy Roman Empire, which was mostly Germany, plus some portions of this, but not all of it, uh, broke up after Napoleon defeated the Austrian armies at Austerlitz. Uh, the Austrian, the Holy Roman Emperor declared that the empire was no more and that in its place, there would be an Austrian empire, which controlled the vast majority of what you see here marked on this screen. 
and it's a hodgepodge of various kingdoms and principalities and random regions that were all just kind of collected over a period of time due to war or uh, marriage and inheritance. Um, let's see. When was that that Austria became that whole area? Uh, the Austrian Empire was declared in 1806. Okay. And it constituted basically these borders. Okay. Uh, and it was a it was a replacement for the Holy Roman Empire, which mostly contained Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, well, Bohemia, and not places like Hungary or this Polish Galicia or the areas further down south. But they were all ruled by the same family. In the middle of the 19th century, the 1850s, Italy, which was a hodgepodge of various individual countries, uh, started to unify because there was this feeling that we are all Italians, we all speak the same language, we all have the same religion, we belong in one country. And the Austrians lost this yellow chunk here due to being defeated by a combination of Italian nationalists and the French who were supporting the Italians. That was then followed about 10 years later in the mid 1860s when the Austrians were defeated again this time by the Prussians up north. Mm. Uh, and the stress of that caused the empire to have to reform again because the Hungarians considered that the German-speaking Austrians who pretty much ruled the country uh, to be you know, holding them down, which they, they felt uh, oppressed and misruled and so the emperor reformed his country as austria hungary and it was a combination of the empire of austria which was austria bohemia and some other places and the kingdom of hungary he was simultaneously emperor and king but hungary had its own separate government its own separate parliament and wasn't really ruled by Austria, though they shared the same monarch and the foreign policy and the military was all held under the same uh, government. Um, let's see. Do I have any other where, where is Venice located in all this? Venice is down on I'm the sorry, Adriatic. I'm, Vienna, I'm sorry. Oh, Vienna? Yeah, sorry. It's on the Danube. I don't know where it is on this map. Let's zoom in. Oops. Oops, sorry. How is it? Well, but over in Aust Austria section of this. Yes, some, okay. somewhere in this red blob. Okay. Vienna? Vienna, yes. Oh, yeah, it would be up. Yeah, it's hard to distinguish where it would be in there, but it would be probably right around where his mouse is now. Yes, somewhere in this region. Right in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the interruption. No, it's fine. Um, and so if you're immigrating front to the United States from this country, um, I suppose the, uh, the people at Ellis Island, the immigration authorities are gonna ask you where you're from and you might answer, I'm from Austria-Hungary or prior to that, Austria. You might answer, I'm from Hungary, or I'm from Croatia, or I'm from Bohemia. You probably would not answer that you are from Prussia, but I suppose somebody might not really know what you're saying. Take the fact that you speak German to mean that you are Prussian or a German. Um, what years would that be if they were coming to my uh, immigrating in? What years would they say 
Austria-Hungary or whatever? Are we talking 1860s to? So nobody would call it Austria-Hungary until after 1867. Prior to that, it was the Austrian Empire from 1806. Would somebody refer to themselves as being from Hungary? Uh, they could do that at any point. Um, Hungary as a region and as a country has existed for centuries. But it wasn't independent from about the 1500s until the 20th century, after the First World War. But they could have said that. They could have said, there. I am Hungarian. It would not have been unusual for them to do that. Uh, because the Hungarians viewed themselves as being their own people. They weren't necessarily friendly with the Austrians, who they probably, in many cases, viewed as um, something between a colonial oppressor or just those foreigners who happened to rule us. Well, that's very um, interesting now. The same would be true among the Polish up north. Um, Poland used to have an extensive empire called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And I've got a map of that somewhere. Can you see that? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a bright colored map. Yes, so this is the end of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. At its height, it controlled even more territory. And these various red, green, and blue colors indicate which neighboring empire took that territory at the end of the 19th century. There were several rebellions against this uh, partition. Some of those uh, rebels having failed to uh, liberate Poland, uh, actually fled to the United States. And at least one of them, Kasomir Pulaski, was a prominent um, leader in the American Revolution. I believe he was killed at one of the uh, early battles and is today considered like one of a very small list of honorary citizens of the United States. Hmm. He was Polish, you said? Yes. Um, look at all that that took over Hungary. Look at that. Well, Hungary is going to be further south. So what's um, that green area? This green area is Galicia, wait, which is that, today part of modern Poland. Wait, what are you pointing at? Uh, you see where it says uh, LWOW? Oh, yeah. I was talking about the one that's the, the, the lime green. Of Budapest. Mm -hmm. That's hung, hung area. Yeah, but that's also Romania right there, I think, in Serbia and... Um, so you won't really see much of Romania on this map. You can see down at the bottom, there's this thing that says Principality of Moldavia. That is part of northern Romania today. Uh, Hungary is this area where it says Kasha. Well, Are you moving your cursor? Because I don't see it. I don't see I'm it. I'm trying to, yeah. I don't see it. Yeah. I think you might be on another. Screen. Oh, there it goes. I saw it. It was there briefly. <laughs> Put your cursor it. by Budapest. <laughs> then I can follow it. Yeah. Uh, Budapest isn't on this map. It's too Oh, yeah. We're on, you're we're looking at Budapest. a different one. Oh, OK. We're know. looking at, it says in the upper left corner. Oh, oh you you're are. looking at this map. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to close this. Because of this now. Let's try it again. Share that screen. Okay, here we go. Oh, no wonder we're confused. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it would change when I changed pictures. Apparently, I was wrong. Um, so yeah, this is this is what became uh, what used to be Poland. Um, now it's all broken up between various countries. You can see Minsk wow. here, which is today's Belarus. Belarus! Oh, sorry. Oh, man. This area is, Bad uh, Belarus, huh? The way they're bad doghouse right now. Mm -hmm. This down here is part of the Ukraine. That's Kiev. Oh. That's part of Slovakia. Um, Vienna is all the way over here in the bottom left corner. Oh, I Budapest. See 
is further south. So this is Poland being divided up by 1700s? Yes. I'm sorry? You said seven. this is the 1700s? Yes, 1772 to 1795. So Poland. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you could see that there were a lot of Polish people in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In the, down south near uh, Krakow, Lublin, Lwów. So and I think they would have been Austria. much less likely to refer to themselves as Austrian or Hungarian. They were Polish. So they and wouldn't they were have not said happy about being part of the uh, empire. I don't think this is helping Mary, huh? <laughs> this is totally like no, because um, I mean it's a super interesting, Caspi, and I don't mean anything negative. It's just oh my, this is a lot. <laughs> oh. yeah, well, depending on who you talk to, I know that like all my relatives, like they did not claim that they were Russian. So most of them were Austro-Hungarians. Not a lot of Polish was thrown around, um, but Ukrainian and Lithuanian. Um, so um, my great-grandmother actually came from the Rava Ruska, which is right near Krakow, Poland. Well. So, you don't think she spoke Polish? Uh, I don't know. It's so, so close you, to Krakow. Yeah. So, the, well, that borders changed also. Um, yes, you've got. Sense. Yeah. Numerous so wars, many. rebellions. There were uh, so many. Yeah, there were so many people that were clean and not wanting to be recruited into the Russian army. Um, there was actually, I belong to a, a face group group, a Ukrainian face group book group, and the post was taken down. But the one lady had said that she had found out that her great grandfather actually turned in a bunch of Jews to the Nazis. And he was like, uh, like when they found out he was pretty much you know, the family didn't want to recognize him and bought that up. And I'm like, wow, like it was just a different time. Some that would not that. have been unusual in uh, Poland, Ukraine or Eastern Russia. Uh, and it's it is controversial to this day that there are uh, Ukrainian groups that um, honor uh, some of the groups that fought in Ukraine after the First World War um, or during the Second World War, who were extremely virulently anti-Semitic um, and during the Second World War sometimes collaborated with uh, the Nazi occupation forces. But there was a lot of people that grew up during that time to include like my generation, my father, not saying that they were pro Hitler, but they kind of understood what he went through. And, you know, but this was like back when there was no internet, you, know, you had to go to a library to look up history or know somebody that had special books and whatnot. So it was kind of very limited, but yeah, like I said, not that, you know, not that my, my dad grew up um hating jews but there was a lot of anti-semitism in my in my house just just growing up from what he learned growing up from from his parents mm -hmm. and what he grew up around so so i could see that and it's definitely from what they experienced and what they went through Generous. yeah there, there were also a lot of um Ukraine had a history of being invaded by the Russians up north, um, and there was a lot of 
we need to get the Russians out, and if the Germans will help us, and this happened in both the First and Second World Wars, we'll, help, we'll let the Germans help us uh, move out the Russians. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Yep. Of course, in both cases, the German occupying authorities weren't really any better, but there's always a that sense of, well, maybe the people over there will be nicer to us than the people here. Yeah, at least they're not Russian. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess and, that was the attitude. <laughs> I'm sorry? I guess that was the attitude. At least they're not Russian. The grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah. I guess. These people aren't actively oppressing us. We're dead, yeah. though. Yeah. And so, well, they, uh, there was a lot of collaboration. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you want me to, if you have any more questions about the border changes. There were a bunch after uh, the First World War, though most of those haven't really changed much since then. Cindy? No, I mean, I know my camp family like, came over before. Before yeah, everybody was here by the First World War, I think. Oh, well, mine, I for sure. But well, I, have a question. I have a question. So, like, my grandmother, she had to work um, in Vienna, Austria, before she came, and that's how she made her way over to this country. So, like, if you lived in Ukraine or Poland, like, I guess a lot of people, and I read somewhere that um, <clears throat> some of the immigrants would go and work in Scotland and other places. They would work in the, um, the coal mines in Scotland and they would make their way um, over to this country. Um, where was like the most popular place? I guess it would be Germany that they would want to come over from. But have you heard of that? that um i know that there were a lot of eastern european and balkan uh coal miners who came over to the united states um i don't know where they would have been mostly coming from i just know you've got people of all sorts um i could think of some families that did that, but I pretty much know them all because they wound up being or wound up having uh, prominent baseball players later on in the 1910s, 1920s, who grew up working in the coal mines as kids or as the children of coal miners. And most of the ones I can think of off the top of my head are Polish. Yeah. But that might not mean anything. Okay. So what port do you think they might most likely departed from and went to? Um, if you're Polish, my guess is you'd probably depart from uh, Gdansk or Königsberg, which today is Kaliningrad. Um, that Hamburg or? Or no, nowhere near it. Um, these are on the Baltic coast. Gdansk is the main port of Poland today, and it is the end of the Vistula River. Uh, Königsberg was a prominent German city up just south of uh, Lithuania. But after World War II, the, when the Russians uh pushed across they said we want this city to be a port for us and so they kicked all of the german residents out of konigsberg um moved in a bunch of russians and renamed it to kaliningrad after a prominent soviet ah, now i see it on the map kaliningrad it's mm -hmm. kind of by lithuania yes konigsberg used to be I think it was the capital of the um, Teutonic Knights state. 
Um, but today, there are basically no Germans living there. It's a Russian enclave on the Baltic. But it is and was a prominent port and a prominent city. If you're from further south, like Austria, Hungary, Croatia, whatnot, I'd expect you would have departed from Venice, Trieste. Yeah, those are probably the most likely ports that you would have departed from, from the Adriatic coast. They would have gone directly to the United States or would they have gone like to Bremen or, or uh, something else? or London or something like that. I think most likely they would have gone directly to the United States. Okay. That would be my guess. That would be more likely the later in the 19th century it is. Earlier you would have had to have stopped at various ports, but. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's most likely you would have uh, come straight to the US. Do you think people were more likely to go south to find a port than to go north? Uh, it depends on, basically, it depends on which side of the uh, the mountains. Central European mountains you're on. Yeah. Um, because most likely you're going to be following the river. Good point. It's going to be cheaper to go that way than to go across the mountains. That's an excellent idea. Yeah, okay. I hadn't thought of that. So yeah. it's also my family probably came out of Trieste or, or Venice. That later in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, while you've got railroads all over, more of the railroads in that region would have gone north to south than east to west. Because of the mountains. Because of the mountains, and that's that's just how the prevailing trade patterns worked like Germany once the first world war broke out didn't have a lot of east to west railroads and so they had a hard time moving food from the more fertile eastern part of Germany to the more urban and industrialized western part of Germany because they needed those east west railroads to move soldiers and uh, equipment and there wasn't a lot of room left for food. From like and, Berlin you're talking about towards Cologne or Frankfurt? Yeah. Um, in peacetime, that wasn't a problem because you didn't need to move thousands of soldiers and thousands of tons of war materials on a daily basis, combined with they didn't have enough rolling stock to move everything they wanted. Plus a railroad can only handle so many trains at a time. so. Um, yeah, there weren't a lot of east-west railroads, which would also have affected your uh, migration patterns. Fascinating. Yeah, so what are you, what are you thinking, Mary? Huh. What port now do you think? I think that the, the biggest the biggest thing is um, for me is just digging and looking more. So, because I pretty much everything that he said def definitely makes sense from what I've been researching and uh, yeah. So I know my grandmother when she came from Vienna, she came over on the Trieste and. Um, her and her sister came over and they, uh, they put themselves down as Hungarian or the Magnars. Magnar Hungaria, uh, yeah. Yeah. That would make sense. Didn't you have a question? I, I told Caspian this, I don't know if you still had a question about it, but we talked a lot about um, Greek, Greek Orthodox. Um, yeah, I had that down written in the notes. Yeah. Tell us, Cass. So 
without more information, it would be hard to say exactly what's going on, but Greek Orthodox is, it's kind of a nebulous term because you have the churches that are under the authority of the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople right. that all speak Greek. Then you have the various Orthodox churches that use uh, Greek as their liturgical language that may or may not be part of that church, that specific organization. And then you have just the concept of all Orthodox churches are kind of treated in uh, much of Eastern Europe as Greek Orthodox because they all descend from the uh, the Roman Empire in the East. So my guess is that this is this Greek, unless you know exactly what church it is, um, that it's probably not a Greek Orthodox church that belongs to the Constantinople Patriarchate and that it's just an Orthodox church in Crimea. Okay. Um, because Greek speaking Orthodox and Russian speaking Orthodox, it's basically the same church. If you're Orthodox, if you're a Greek speaking Orthodox Christian in Crimea, you can go to a Russian speaking church and participate fully in the, um, ceremonies and sacraments okay you might not understand what's going on um depending on what exactly they're saying but it would kind of be like going problem. to a catholic church where they're speaking in spanish exactly you kind you of might not know what they're saying yeah. but, but they do you the can same. participate fully yeah when they all speak latin at that point no I don't know. Some of the like, records are some of the records are in Latin. When I had gone to that um, that conference, when they were because a lot of the the records for um, my ancestors in the Ukraine are in Lviv, and most of their records are actually in Latin. Huh. Yeah. So some of them are. Yeah, but it depends on the year that when you go there. But yeah. Well, Susan, your relatives from Slovakia, aren't they? Slovenia. 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 I meant, I'm sorry. I <laughs> know them's fighting words, Deirdre. <laughs> Slovenia. Um, uh, aren't they Orthodox? Weren't they Orthodox? I think they were Roman Catholic. At least I, I know so almost nothing about my family before they came just what I've told you guys in the past what the rumor is is that my grandfather spoke multiple languages served in some sort of war had some sort of helmet that looked like it had some kind of tassel thing on it at some point and uh, served in some sort of military before he came over probably in the 1890s is a probably a 30 year old man something like that and that's about all I know is I was just told that he spoke lots of languages and I can't find his his um, immigration paperwork, anything, nothing. Well, I found some for different people who could be him, but it, I, since he, I don't know enough and the name is Anton, you know, it's a Frank, I mean, but he probably left from Trieste uh, because that was right there. That would be a major port as Cass just said, but you know, the idea that I think I've even seen Bohemian on some of these, these, uh, uh, maybe not my family was Bohemian, but some of the people near them, whenever they filled out the census, you would see people above in Bohemia or saying Bohemian. And then the one right underneath might say Austria-Hungary. Another one might say Hungary. One would say, you know, so depending on which form, but Cass said that, what, what was it you said about our families that being in Slovenia, uh, in the 1890s, I mean, 1880s, 1860, he was born in 1864, so 1870s, 1880s, mm -hmm. they would have been living in what country at the time? The Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, 
um, which and that would have been Roman Catholic, not Ye really yes. Orthodox. Um, the empire was officially Catholic, and Slovenia today is still uh, heavily Catholic. Roman uh, Catholic. If, yeah, it's never well. Yes, it's never been uh, Orthodox. I'm not sure I know the difference between Orthodox and not. Do, do we all? I don't know if that's, is, it, is um, there an easy way of explaining that? The easiest way to explain it is the Orthodox churches don't accept the Pope as the supreme, um, as the primary leader of Christianity. The Pope that is in Rome. Yes, the Bishop of Rome. Popes. Um, there are theological differences and there are liturgical differences, um, but the simplest explanation is the, they do not say that the Pope in Rome is the first among all the bishops. What is he? Uh, he is merely one of the most important bishops, but he doesn't have any claim of authority over the bishops of Constantinople and Jerusalem and Alexandria and so on. And Constantinople is Istanbul now. It is Istanbul, but they still use the term Constantinople for uh, religious uh, purposes. Oh. What, Deirdre? Um, Her head just went boom. What? Well, because this, how can we keep up when, when we're calling Istanbul Constantinople or well, I guess you can watch the video by They Might Be Giants and they sing yeah. the whole song and they explain the whole thing. Istanbul is basically what the Turkish government decided to rename the city after they decided we are no longer a religiously based country anymore. We are no longer an Islamic empire. We are now merely a country. Um, and I think I read somewhere Istanbul comes from Greek and it basically means to the city. And so people would say that they were going to Istanbul, they were going to the city. Uh -oh. um, yeah. But yeah, basically the difference between Catholics and Orthodox Christians is most prominent in terms of how they treat who is in charge. But there are uh, differences in how they worship and exactly what they believe, but those get a little uh, esoteric and can be a little confusing. There are other Orthodox churches in what we would call the Middle East and North Africa today that are themselves separate and they have much more significant differences uh, religiously. Uh, and it comes down to whether they agreed with the decisions of the big church councils like at Nicaea and uh, Chalcedon or whether they disagreed with those decisions. So it's and even so they, further splendored. They also claim to be Orthodox, but we use the term Oriental Orthodox to refer to those. Uh, I don't think, I I don't think they one. would. Oriental Orthodox? No, I don't think I've heard of that either. Right. That I don't be, know much about the subject, so. Uh, the most prominent or Oriental Orthodox Church are the uh, Coptic Christians in Egypt. Oh, well, I've heard of them. I just didn't know they were Oriental Orthodox. Yeah, so they... They are not part of the Eastern Orthodox Church that would be like the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox. They are separate. And they're also not affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church. You said something else I thought was interesting the other day about Istanbul and the, the passage that you have to use to get there, because that would be an important trade route to get to Ukraine and Crimea and Romania and things, something about that, that, uh, what's that called? Um, the waterways. Dardanelles. Hmm? The Dardanelles. You said something about it being by the Bo Bola, what do they call it? The... You were saying that something about the law says it has to remain open. Oh, yeah. Screen so screen. you could see if I zoom way, way out, 
that you've got the Black Sea, a whole bunch of big rivers all empty into the Black Sea. But the only way to get from the Black Sea out into the Mediterranean and the oceans is through this narrow channel here, um, right past Istanbul. Uh -huh. And then from there through this narrow strait here. And by international law, they have to stay open. Huh. Because nobody who has any interest in trade with this region wants them to be closed. That's also uh -huh. why this city exists, why the Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome over here, because he wanted to have control, direct control over those critical trade routes between the uh, wealthy regions out here, Egypt, uh, the Levant and Asia Minor and Greece. Whereas there wasn't as quite as much wealth over here moving around. Oh, really? Yep. And, uh, uh, Persia, hugely wealthy at the time, Asia Minor, tons and tons of wealthy cities. Um, the Levant and Egypt, which was a massive grain producer. Still is, actually. Huh. I would thought the Mediterranean would be richer. No, I mean, there's plenty of wealth out here. It's just more wealth was concentrated in the East than in the West. And I think partly that's because um, cities and empires pretty much started up in the East earlier than they did in Western Europe. So they had a much, uh, they started earlier and thus had a great big head start. Head start. Hmm. Okay, should we go to Tamberley or do you guys got more questions? For well, wait, so the Bosphorus is different than the Dardanelles? Uh, they're technically two straits. Uh, let me just put that up again. So the Bosphorus is this strait going immediately past Istanbul. The Dardanelles are this strait. Wait, which one's which? Between them. Oh, there's back up like two parts. parts. Wait a minute. Uh, okay, so th you're showing right now your cursors on the Dardanelles. The Dardanelles are down here. That's where the little red. Oh, okay, the Dardanelles are by. Um, well, there, the there, aren't, there aren't a oh, lot of. Oh, really I see. Big and up by Istanbul is the Bosphorus. So, the, yes. so it's closer to Greece. Than... Okay, I see. They have to, and that must be internationally open, also. Yes, both both of these have to be kept open. Okay. So, what is that sea called there? The Sea of Mar. Sea of Marmara. I don't think I've really heard of that before. Either. Well, I mean, is it important? Uh, it, as part of this international trade route, uh, yes, but in and of itself, not so much. It's got some relatively major cities on it, but I don't suppose it is on its own any more important than, say, the um, the San Francisco Bay would be. The actual bay isn't so much important. It's the ability to move stuff from between San Francisco, Oakland, and Sacramento and back out. So I would think this the Sea of Marmara, is that what you said? Yep. I, I, it looks like it would be a huge place to buy things because you got stuff coming from uh, you know, Russia, Ukraine, yeah. in that area through there, as well as the other way from Turkey and the Mediterranean in. So it seems like that would be just a big hub of where where everything's passing through either way. Yep. That's why Constantinople was probably the biggest city in Europe and the Near East for a millennium, 
easily. And these are big waterways? I mean, it's not like the Suez or anything like that? Uh, it's pretty narrow. At its narrowest, it's, I think, less than a mile across. Oh, well, that's not that narrow. You could get easily get a ship through there. I mean, it's not like the Suez where you had to like, wait your turn to get through. It, it, it is wider than the Suez, but it is pretty narrow and can easily be blocked. During the First World War, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, did block this strait. And the British and French uh, lost a quarter of a million soldiers trying to open it up. And they Ooh. failed. What was that campaign called? Uh, Gallipoli, after the name of this long peninsula. That looks Anybody? really narrow in there, right? I'm sorry? It does look really narrow. Oh, part. the narrowest part here is, a, I don't know, a mile across. And this strait was heavily mined. There were oh. forts on both sides. Um, and the British and French said, we need to open this up so that we can buy wheat from the Russians and send weapons to them because the Russians were their, the other major ally they had at the time. And all of their other ports are either very, very far away from the front line or are difficult to get to in winter, if not impossible. This waterway was the only way that you could get ships to Russia at all times of year, and Turkey closed it off. The British and French tried to take it. They tried to force ships through this uh, strait so that they could just sail right up to Constantinople and start uh, bombarding it if Turkey didn't uh, agree to drop out of the war. But because of a small, relatively small number of mines, they were never able to get through. Oh, I don't know much dropped. about that history at all. That's not really talked mm. about that much. They moved soldiers onto this peninsula in order to try and take control of it so that then they could clear the mines and get the ships through. And they spent nine months doing this and they were unable to do it. Um, if you know anybody who is Australian or New Zealander, you can ask them about the Anzacs. Oh, yeah, yeah, were, that's an, I've heard of that. They were the Australian and New Zealand soldiers who were organized into one body and sent to fight in this campaign. And one of these beaches over here is called Anzac Cove. Ah, there it is. Anzac Koyupai. This is this is where they were deployed to try and capture this peninsula, and a lot of them got killed. They were unable to succeed, but it became a rallying point for Australian and New Zealand nationhood. Hmm. Um, later, oh, it got wow. turned into a movie with Mel Gibson for obvious reasons. What was that called? Gallipoli. Oh, I don't think I know that. Oh, interesting. I don't I, think I, it was supposed to be a terribly good movie, but it's it's kind of like the brave heart of uh, Australia and New Zealand. And this is World War II? One. Oh, one. Turkey was neutral throughout World War II. I remember going to, yeah, this makes sense to me now, because I can remember when I was in New Zealand and Australia on their 100th anniversary of World War I. And, you know, museums were devoted to it over there. And it was this Anzac, it was like everywhere. They were talking about it. The museums had these displays and, you know, how they went together. And I didn't realize where it was and I didn't know anything about the campaign or anything. Now that is very interesting. I had, I had no clue. Mm -hmm. I just know that it's very, very patriotic. You see huge memorials devoted to it in mm -hmm. New Zealand and, and Australia. Yeah, the, the Anzac experiences as important to Australians and New Zealanders as something like uh, Iwo Jima is to Americans, or I don't know, uh, something like Saratoga or Yorktown. Interesting. I had no idea. I just assumed it. I don't know. I didn't assume anything because I don't think I had any. Yeah. I didn't have any way of understanding it. 
Very, very good, Caspian. My, my computer, I don't know, totally like shut down oddly. Um, did I miss like Caspian? How, how do you know all this stuff? Did you, what did you study? Not from his mom. <laughs> Uh, well, most of this I just pick up from reading things. Uh, I did have to go and look some things up that were specific to what uh, you all had mentioned a week ago. Um, oh, I think you should be on Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's really good retention, I think, is a lot of it. I think a lot of human beings we we learn this we hear it but just retaining it it's just and yeah. being able to spell it back out but caspian's always been like a like turning on a wikipedia page he'll explain it to you in a way that makes sense and then you can kind of click on another <laughs> hyperlink and he'll go to the next hyperlink and explain that go to the next hyperlink and you're in you know you're on beans and in, in france somewhere you know you when you started out in some completely a obscure other topic but everything's connected to each other and he's just always been very good at this and that's kind of how, how I think of him as like a little Wikipedia. He taught me what Wikipedia was and he's the first person who started editing Wikipedia back in the day when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. hey. So talk about Tamberly because I know she's, she's gonna be watching this video wondering when she's gonna to get to her part. So <laughs> what I recall her mentioning was that she had someone who, a, an ancestor who moved from Bermuda to Massachusetts in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. Um, she also mentioned something about a secret mission to Bermuda during the American Revolution. So what I was able to find out about Bermuda was in the 1640s um, in England, the big thing that was happening was the civil wars between Parliament and the King. Bermuda remained royalist. It was uh, loyal to King Charles, not hugely so. You didn't see hundreds of Bermudans uh, join uh, the Royalist army and go to England to fight, but it did remain largely in supportive of the king, and I forget why. But when Charles was beheaded by Parliament, um, Bermuda remained pretty uh, royalist, and Parliament said, passed a, an ordinance that said, we're forbidding all trade with Bermuda. There were a few other places, too, that were uh, strongly royalist and overseas, but Bermuda was one of those that was mentioned by name. And my guess is that her ancestor moved from Bermuda to Massachusetts probably for economic reasons because it was becoming harder to make a living in Bermuda off of trade. Because their main partner would have been England. Their, yes, and England was saying no trade with Bermuda. Uh, this disappeared after a few years, they came to an agreement. Uh, and then a few years after that, uh, the monarchy was restored in England. But my guess is during the eight, during the 1640s, um, Bermuda was struggling economically as a result of a blockade, well, a, an embargo by England and just the conflict that was going on at the time. There was also something that I read about how Bermuda had started out as a colony that was focusing on trade, but they started building ships around this time and deforested a lot of the islands. Oh. And that might have also had something to do with it, maybe maybe shipbuilding was no longer as viable because there weren't as many good trees. You can't just use any tree to build a wooden ship. Um, you need specific types of trees, and in particular, you need really tall, really straight trees in order to build masts. Um, in England, 
there were laws passed forbidding someone from felling a tree that could be used for a mast. And some of those similar ordinances were also passed in the United States um, that said, you know, we need certain types of trees to grow so that we can use them to build uh, ships. I had no idea. I didn't know any of this either. Yeah, it, 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 it so was a sense, yeah. Yeah, it so, was a matter of military and economic necessity. You don't want somebody felling a nice tree that could be used for a mast or that could be used for extremely long planks needed for a ship just so that they could build a house or turn it into firewood. So what year was Tamberly? I can't remember whenever Tamberly was talking on the last video. Did she say the 1600s? I didn't she, know she went back that far back. She mentioned the 1640s specifically. Oh, well, I guess she did know. I don't remember At least that. That's what I have written down. Um, so yeah, well, I mean, I know she is... dates before the 1640s. We all do. <laughs> right. My guess is the civil wars caused her ancestor to move from Bermuda to Massachusetts. The civil wars in England. In England, yes. Now, and there the... was mm -hmm. a secret military mission to Bermuda during the American Revolution. Um, looks like it was to pick up some arms that the uh, British military had stored in Bermuda. I think Bermuda was fairly pro-American uh, during uh, our revolution. Well, probably because that would have been their trade partner by then. Yes, it's a lot closer to the Americas than it is Europe. And if you could finish up with the, the the Key West thing that Tamberly had asked me about before, you gave me some information I told her, but maybe you could fill it in now since we're recording this and she can listen to you about why her, she found a, one of her relatives was stationed at Key West during the Civil War, American Civil War. Sure. I'm going to share my screen again because geography is critical. So... Key West was, there was a army base there prior to the war, and its job was to protect this, uh, this passage here between Cuba and the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> Key West was never, was lost to the Confederacy. It remained a Union stronghold throughout the war, despite Florida having joined the Confederacy, because it's really hard to send an army there if you don't have a lot of ships. It became pretty critical because the Union's strategy was essentially, we're going to cut the South off from trade, overseas trade. Um, and if you control Key West, you can have ships stationed there that can patrol this strait between uh, Florida and Cuba. And it becomes a heck of a lot harder for Confederate ships to get through that region or for neutral ships to get through in order to trade with the Confederacy. And particularly, oh. they would want to go to New Orleans, which was the biggest port at the time in the Americas, at the, uh, the end of the Mississippi River, and a huge export region for cotton and foodstuffs. So by holding Key West, it makes it a lot easier to control that passage between Florida and Cuba. Who had Cuba at the time? Uh, Spain. Oh. Okay. But the important point is more that you can't sail through Cuba. You have to sail around Cuba. And it's a lot faster to sail north of Cuba than to sail south of Cuba and go all the way around, particularly if you don't have weather stations that can tell you a hurricane is coming. But it had been quieter and calmer more of the time going around Florida. So what you're it would just be a lot shorter. You're, you're cutting several days off of your journey by going through this region between, between Florida and Cuba, then going all the way around Cuba and th through this uh, strait between Cuba and Haiti or even further. And there's a just, lot of storms. It's days shorter. Right. And the, another question I had was about... Um, Britain's involvement in World War II, I remember 
from something that uh, they didn't want to take sides. It was a big deal. Uh, I think Queen Victoria's husband was, uh, what's his name, Albert? He, uh -huh. was, he was really, I think the South was asking for help. They wanted support from, from England. And England's like, well, we really should support the South because we really do a lot of trade with the cotton. We really need economically. But I think they were really split up because they're like, we can't support secession and we can't support that. So they were trying to stay neutral as long as they could, but and trying to appease things. Is that what I'm, is that right? What I was remembering? It was Albert. Uh, so you mean our civil war? Yeah, our American civil war. Yeah. Yes. Um, there was some pro Southern sentiment in Britain. Uh, they didn't have a problem with secession. They did have a problem with slavery. Uh, the British Empire had banned slavery about 30 years before. Uh, they had banned the slave trade about 60 years before. And slavery in Britain was pretty much unknown and had been pretty much unknown for a thousand years or more. There were serfs that they were not considered to be slaves. And of course, ser serfdom had disappeared centuries prior to this. Um, most of the sentiment, I believe, was economic. They wanted access to uh, American cotton. And some of it was the desire to weaken the growing power of the United States. And if you could split the United States in two, then you've got two much weaker powers who hate each other and will be focusing on each other rather than potentially threatening Britain's empire in Canada or further south in the uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. That makes so much sense. <laughs> but I ah. thought of that. <laughs> of course, the uh, British had a lot of reasons why they would want to stay out. They didn't want to lose access to the vast markets of the northern United States either. And they didn't want to get into a conflict with the United States and then potentially see Canada invaded. That would have been a disaster. They would have had to try and shuttle hundreds of thousands of soldiers into Canada, an extremely expensive and time consuming measure that might not have worked, particularly since Britain didn't have hundreds of thousands of soldiers at the time. And most of the ones that they had were needed in India, which had just had a massive rebellion. You mean, um, so they didn't want to piss off North America because they thought North America would go into Canada. That would be a serious threat, yes. Mm -hmm. So you've got, well, we want to break up the United States because then they won't be a threat to Canada. But also, we don't want to antagonize the Americans because then they might come after Canada. You have the people who want the textile manufacturers who want access to cheap American cotton. And then you have the other manufacturers who want access to trade and sell their goods into the United States. You have the people who don't particularly care that the Confederacy uh, permits slavery, and you have the people who are really, really opposed to the idea of backing a uh, slave state. And you, those two cross currents in the British government and in British society uh, were constantly at loggerheads through the first year or two of the war. Finally, the matter pretty much came became resolved when it looked like the Union was going to win. And at that point, the British are saying, well, there's, you know, we're not going to side with somebody who looks like they're going to lose. <laughs> that would be the worst case scenario. Yeah. And that's, that's usually how things worked politically in wars involving Europe in that time. Neutral countries who might have a reason to get involved would look at the conflict and try and figure out who they think is going to win. And then they're going to side with the people who they think are going to win. They weren't always correct, but that was that was how it worked. And France was still 
uh, like a rival to England at the time. And yeah. France was siding with the South, right? France had exactly the same deliberation and exactly the same conclusion as Britain. Maybe it's a good idea to break up the Americans, maybe not. Um, what are the British going to do? And ultimately, they came to the same conclusion, we're not going to get involved. Oh, so France didn't get involved. I thought they were kind of siding with the South. Uh, no, there was some minor support by both Britain and France towards the Confederacy. Um, the British government did permit the Confederacy to purchase ships from British shipyards. <clears throat> and after the war, that became a big uh, matter of litigation. Oops. And, and, and Spain wasn't a power at the time, right? I'm sorry? Spain wasn't really... Spain was a declining power. They still okay. controlled a lot of territory in the Americas, but they had lost most of it. And they were too busy with their own problems at the time, which included multiple civil wars and so on. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there was a surprising amount of Russian support for the Union at the time, and there was a lot of German support for the Union. Really? In fact, the German speaking population in the United States was still so large at the time that Lincoln was forced to keep in uniform an incompetent general by the name of Franz Siegel because he was so good at recruiting those German-speaking men to serve in the Union Army. Uh, Franz Siegel was not a good military commander, uh, but he was popular and they, they couldn't afford to get rid of him because it would have hurt their recruiting efforts. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a complicated <laughs> world. Well, it's all oh. connected. I think that's what's interesting yeah. is that if you know a little bit more about some other area, maybe that helps you understand the area yeah. you can understand because they're all connected. I yeah, think it also, is... with the Germans, it was also, there were a lot of people who fled Germany after the revolutions in 1848. I was concerned about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, all through Europe in 1848, there were upheavals, mostly between um, liberals in Europe who wanted to see constitutional monarchies. They wanted freedom of speech, freedom of the press. They opposed absolute monarchies. And mostly they their rebellions failed. They were put down. And a lot of them had to flee. They, of course, fled to the United States which was a democracy that allowed freedom of speech and freedom of the press. When yeah, my, my people from Swishley Holstein came over in 1852, and there was some newspaper article later who re that referred to the 1848 rebellion and all that yep um that's exactly the time frame when somebody would have been fleeing <laughs> from europe as a result of uh the counter revolutions that broke out against the uh demands of the reformers so 1848 was that and then you're saying after that they were counter yeah um you had a lot of rebellions that broke out in 1848 Mm -hmm. And they fed on each other when the French heard that the Germans were revolting, it inspired them and then it inspired the Austrians and so on. Um, and it took a few years for these things to die down, but ultimately the powerful monarchies mostly defeated the um, revolutions. The only major success of the revolutionaries was in France where they overthrew the then monarchy, they put in power the nephew of Napoleon uh, because he claimed to be a reformer 
And then four years later, he declared himself emperor anyway. Jerk. <laughs> uh, and his only qualification was that his name was Napoleon and he was related to the Napoleon. Hmm. Ask me, is there anything else on your list uh, uh, of notes that you took that from what Tamberly especially said? Because I want to make sure we, we, we get all that in before we disembark. Not from Tamberly. The only other thing I had written down was Cindy wanted to know about the colonial wars in America. And I was thinking of Tamberly um, partly for that because she had people back that far. Susan, on your other side, not on your mother's side, they go back to the Revolutionary War before. On my mother's side, we go back to the 1600s. Yeah, so, and then I have people back that far. What was, what was it you wanted to know, Cindy? Oh, I don't know, just a general. I know that there was at least four known big ones. I guess, are there, do we know if there's records available? Um, who were they that fought? I guess they would have mostly been the B British because of colonial. So were they fighting each other or were they fighting Canada or who um, were they fighting? Mostly in America, these wars were between either the English and the French settlers. In Canada. Um, in the, yes, particularly yeah. with regards to Canada and also Louisiana. Okay. Um, or they were between the European colonists and the Native Americans. And oh, okay. the, in both cases, um, these conflicts were related to European conflicts, mostly. Uh, Britain and France went to war, and as a result, they told their leaders in the Americas to start fighting the colonies of the other country and try and capture them because they will be valuable trading uh, commodities when it's time to make peace. Uh, wars at that time were not fought to take control of the opposing country. They were fought for a narrow political purpose to gain control of some relatively small thing like a small region in Europe, or the rights to inherit a certain throne, <laughs> or in one case, the right to uh, control the uh, Atlantic slave trade. Uh, but mostly those conflicts broke out as a result of the fighting in Europe and the leaders in Europe telling the colonists, okay, time to start fighting. There were a couple of cases where the fighting started in America and then spread to Europe or was otherwise just isolated within the Americas, but mostly it was an outgrowth of a European war. Hmm. And mostly the fighting took the form of allying with one or more Native American groups in Europe, not Europe, sorry, in North America and selling weapons to them and saying, go attack this region where these people live. That was very common. So I think I read or learned somewhere that any records related to that wouldn't be here in America because there was no real government, no even states, I don't think. Could they be in England or France or something like that, I guess. And, or if there were even any records, like who the soldiers were. Uh, no, I, my guess is if the muster rolls still exist, then they're probably here. Uh, they would not have been sent back to Europe. There would have been no reason for the European governments to know the names of all the soldiers in the uh, Massachusetts militia or whatnot. Uh -huh. 
Okay. Um, so my guess is if they have records of who was enrolled in these militias and who the officers were and how they were organized, they're here if they still exist, if they haven't been lost in a fire or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so under the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the Massachusetts Bay Colony or whatever. Right, yeah. they might have records or some of the uh, older universities might have some of those records these days. Good idea. Yeah. But if they exist, they're probably here. Okay. Historical societies. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on the topic because we all think of the Revolutionary War, but really there was events before that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, I count at least four major wars prior to the American Revolution that were fought here in the Americas. And what do you call, what are they? Um, the four big ones were called by colonists King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, and the French and Indian War. <laughs> they are more commonly known around the world as the Nine Years' War, the War of the Spanish Succession, the War of the Austrian Succession, and the Seven Years' War. Isn't that funny? None of them have anything to do with America? Nope. Um, the Seven Years' War did pretty much spark because of an outbreak of fighting in the Americas. And it was, I think it was largely English colonists were upset that the British government was telling them they couldn't establish colonies on the western half of the Appalachian Mountains. And they said, well, no, we want that land. And I think one of the colonies, one of the colonial governments sent a militia over there and pretty much started the fighting, which then sparked fighting in Europe that erupted worldwide. God. Well, they, Britain and France and the other European powers were already on uh, hair triggers because they wanted something to, you know, capture something. So it was kind of an excuse. Late 1600s, early 1700s? Um, Mid 1700s? This period pretty much runs from 1689 to 1763. Those four wars all occurred mm -hmm. between those 75 years. Okay. Um, so if our family one, was here, we probably were had some involvement in some of those. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yes. Every able-bodied man was supposed to serve in the militia. I don't know how thorough that was. But as a general policy, all English colonists, all English male colonists who could hold a musket were supposed to. Free colonists. Yes, there is that caveat, yes. So, so Mary, um, the Cyberts were back that far, I'm pretty sure. I know, it's, I know John had gotten his Cyberts into Virginia, Revolutionary War, I think. So they, they may have been back in those colonial wars also. So okay. Sean has a long history. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, so. Is there anything else that was on your notes, Caspian? Uh, nothing I wrote down. Well, that was really fascinating. Does anybody else have any other questions that are quick that we can sneak in? I'm just amazed at your depth of knowledge over such a wide range of things, not just military, but, you know, boundaries and borders. Yeah. And like I said, it's like a Wikipedia page. He, he goes from one topic to the next topic to the next topic because they're all connected. And to know yeah. something about one topic, you go, well, I guess I got to understand this. And well, I guess I got to understand why the price of beans is what it is in that country, because that <laughs> right. makes sense. And but, but what about the trade route? Well, well, wait a minute. How do those beans get? No. <laughs> so, 
it's very interesting. Well, Caspian, thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Yeah, um, really. I hope oh, I thank you, thank you. Sorry, somebody came to my door. Did he leave? No, he's here. No, no, he's still there. <laughs> so, so I think that maybe, you know, if this is helpful to everybody, because I know it helped me a lot to be able to at least think about um, why my family was kind of doing what it did. It gave me, instead of just, you know, I'm a, I'm a social historian. That's my interest. So to understanding why things happened not only helps me figure out where to look, but it kind of gives me more depth into what the what was going on in my family's the personalities of them, the the um, just just the reasons things kind of might have happened. Like like Caspian said, he can't know for sure that Deirdre's family went to uh, Paris to work on the railroads, but that sure was happening at the time, and it would have been a big draw, and it would have made sense for us. My there. my parents were just here and i just told them my mom's like i am sure that was it yeah I'm oh. like, I, I am sure too i mean it just makes it, sense it just makes sense it kind of fits it it fits that whole realm so maybe i don't know if you guys are interested if Cass is willing to do it again in a few months maybe if we feel like we are having more questions that come up we could write them down and then just maybe do another session with him or something and kind of get a little sure. more information as we come across questions what do you guys think yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. we haven't even talked about it much about like world war one or world war two or you know any of those and everybody's got that involvement so well given given that i was able to identify some of the things from the pictures that uh Tamberly had um if i'd be perfectly happy to like try and identify things from pictures particularly from that era if any of you have any wait you saw pictures from tamberly yeah tamberly gave me here i'll share my screen real quick and i'll show you just real quick that whenever i went over to tamberly's house the other day oh where did i put him um i just was i'm like can i take a copy of this and she's and i was just snapping him with my camera so i came home and i uploaded them and i had my thumb in a lot of the pictures because I was just doing it really fast. But um, so I went and I edited the pictures and took and put, um, and I showed them to Caspian because we had we had uh, lunch the other day. We can have lunch now <laughs> in public in like buildings <laughs> that have wait staff and stuff like that. It was really <laughs> awesome to be to be honest with you. And so what I did is I, sh I showed him the things on my phone and then Tamberly came over and dropped something off a couple of days ago. And I said, hey, Tamberly, um, check out, check out um, what Caspian said about these pictures of yours. And Tamberly's just had them in boxes. And to be honest with you, I'm going to go and Tamberly's leaving today. So she's watching this in a week. If you go to your attic and you find that that box is missing Tamberly, because <laughs> I'm threatening to go in and take the pictures from her because there's there's it's so interesting she's just got these things there there's there's like I said there's a diary of a woman that was her her um her world war one, you said world war one well so. she's got a huge amount of history sitting oh, okay there. she's got uh um images from she's just been remember how i was telling you guys the other day that some people become the receptacles of yeah. family everything and tamberly has just been the person that in her family everything came to her and and she sorted it and it's sitting in a box and she's just i've sorted it and someday I've got to get to this and do something with it. And I'm like, let's scan it. And she's like, oh yeah, okay. But <laughs> I want to just go and do it, you know. I'm trying to find the Caspian, did you go to Selena's High? No. Where'd you go? No, I, I went to York. You went to York, um, yeah. That's what which I is why we have so much debt in my household. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he's very smart. Yes. So he got he to York also. because we sent because he, I, I don't think he would have done as well as Slay's High, but my other son went to Slay's High. 
Um, I just wondered if you were more or less the same age as my kids. What year did you graduate? If I mean, I if that 2006. Huh. He's a youngster. Yeah, he's, he's just... I, my Megan graduated from Salinas High in 2006. Did oh. you? 2006 really your kids okay okay i've got these pictures there's only like six pictures i'll show you really quick um and then hopefully maybe in the meantime i'll be able to get them from tamberly <laughs> but um she's done a really good job getting everything in in place and Cass, if you want to just like really quick like say what these are let me go to the screen share my thing i had assuming i really know some of them it's pretty uh, obvious yeah what they so are. so the first picture i'm going to show you is the one that she she's like i don't know what this is and cass knew exactly what it was do you see it yep harry yep. Ben. oh that's freaky why do they have that long hair uh, it was a religious thing the house of david was a religious movement in the ninth, early part of the 20th century uh one of the things that they were known for was they didn't cut their hair. Like Samson? Yeah. I probably, um, but what they're most famous for is that they had traveling baseball teams. <laughs> huh. If you've ever had access to the Ken Burns documentary on baseball, he yeah. covers the House of David. Really? I yep. don't even remember that. Luxurious hair. So yes. I, was reading, I read the Wikipedia page after Cass told me about this, and these people, they had bands, they had an amusement park, they were, you know, proselytizing, proselytizing, but they also, with the baseball thing, Cass said that they used to have, every town had a baseball team, and they would travel, and um, that, that these people eventually ended up, the House of David ended up hiring out people, and they'd wear fake beards and fake weird uh, hair. And they hired black people, the Negro Leagues. They had a lot of the, some of the famous Negro League players would play on their teams because they could, but they were supposedly really good. But uh, the, I, I didn't know anything about that. So to hear are these pictures now, I cleaned them all up because they had my thumb in the picture like this. Oh, I just took the picture really quick. Like I went boom and took the picture. So these aren't scanned, but these are pictures that Tamberly said that her, her uncle or great uncle brought back from, uh, sent home from, from his uh, time in World War I in France. And Cass started looking at him. Uh, this, my guess is it was taken at the boundary of the American occupation zone on the Rhine River after World War I. We did have troops in Germany um, for a few years after World War I, along with the British and French, and they controlled several strategic bridgeheads over the Rhine. My guess is that is what this is a picture of. And it would have to be after, he said, because look, the signs made and everything, so it wasn't like... Right. They, they would have had no reason to have written this sign during the actual fighting. It looks uh, cold. Those kids look like they're cold. cold. Oh, it's probably uh, winter. This is Okay, where's that? That is. Yeah, I, I cannot identify where these are, not without more information. Yeah, but... she probably has like his where he served and stuff like that. She probably has a document that has that and you could match them up with the, the photos. Thank probably. You. But these are these are the cleaned up versions of what I took out of her her house. And you can see this is so the repairs are already happening. Mm -hmm. now, certainly. Oh during the fighting, they would have built bridges over uh, rivers and canals when they needed to cross them. So this could have happened during the actual fighting, but my guess is with the other pictures, this is probably post-war. Uh, that one we could figure uh, out where it is, but I don't know where uh, Montfaucon is off the top of my head. It's like a mausoleum. The graveyard. Yeah, and it looks like there's a lot of damage to the graveyard as well. Yeah. That's a Saint Chalmant tank. It's French. And That's it was a piece of junk. Everybody knows just off the drop of there. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And really? You know, no, I, I knew it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to show off or anything. <laughs> you could tell just by looking at it, it had it a hell of a time crossing trenches because of 
how short the tracks are compared to the whole body. If it tried to cross a trench, uh, it's gonna nosedive right into it. Right. So they weren't uh, well done. No, in, in fact, ironically, they were more useful as the war was ending when the fighting broke out into open territory than they were when they were originally introduced. And you can see the name of the sh of it here, La yeah. Big Bigor. It's yeah, hard to read. B i g o r b i g o n e. Something but like you that. can also like B -I -G -O -R -R -E. with, with that picture, you could probably identify what unit it belonged to, because next to the name, there's a there's a club's symbol with a one over it. This? Oh, this! Yes, which would have indicated what um, what company and what battalion it belonged to, probably. Oh. Huh. I didn't know that. That took a tumble. Huh? So it looks I like... They... Is, these bridges that were destroyed were probably blown up when the Germans were retreating. They weren't hit um, during the actual fighting. Mm. Look at that, wow. Um, I think that's the last picture. Oh no, this is another picture from, this is this is Tamberley's grandfather down here. And this was a, a, it took us a while, but Tamberley and I figured, she figured out it's a, it was a theater, you know, where you had plays in mm -hmm. uh, Columbus, Ohio. And her whole family was part of this at some point. You know, everybody always took a turn at being in this theater. And one of the things, it'd be like living around here and you went to the Western stage and everybody always had a child or something that was in it. Not me, but I was raised on the East side, but you know, Tamberley Stamberley and Cindy Stamberley, they would Western stage. So she says, these were all the ushers. Oh, so I, you know, I said, let's make a nice scan of this because it's wrinkled. I mean, I just took a picture of it really quick and cleaned it up a little bit. But I would think that these people's family would love to have a copy of this, their ancestors. If this, if yeah. there was a way of getting it to the historical society of this, the library or something over in Columbus that would have been the repository of theater programs or whatever. I would think that these people would be really interested in, in having a picture like this because sure. you can see their faces really well, you know, their moment in time. This guy over here looks terrified. His eyes were really big. Mm -hmm. And this guy, I just realized it's not a mustache, these little dots, I gotta clean that up. But I, I wanted to just scan the picture and do a nice scan of it. And I think that's, I think that's all the pictures. Yeah, that was all the pictures. But anyway, so those are the ones I just took from Tamberly and she's got stacks. <laughs> I'm like, girl, come on, let's take care of this. But I guess we'll wait until after the, the weekend and I better not go over. I don't have a key to her house, so I'd have to break a window. <laughs> <laughs> Might set off her alarm. Wait. You'd have to explain. We just blame it on the cats. I don't know who's taking care of the house, but I was gonna offer to take care of the house, but I'm I have a busy weekend ahead of me and I don't have time to scan it. But but that's the kind of thing I'm really interested in is taking a box of documents and photos and just scan the heck out of them try to put them in some sort and then yeah. just give it back to the person on a hard drive or something and then they can have them to sort because again i told tamberly you know my motto what happens if something happens to your house right this is gone right she said yeah this is gone nobody has it it's gone the history's lost so i'm like well then let's get them done but you know i nag everybody like that all the time Caspian and Caspian and Sterling both have a copy, a hard drive of everything I owned. And so I have a copy and it's also on a cloud in case the West Coast falls in the ocean. But it's there. You know, they could someday we could do something more with it, but at the moment at least it's yeah copied. Okay. All right, you guys. Are we done? So, Should we let Caspian go? We let Caspian go. Thank you, Caspian. We don't know what we're doing next week yet. We All right. Thank you, Caspian. I'll see Caspian, you in a couple hours. Thank trivia. You. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's great at um, trivia. Oh yeah, he is, he's I a ringer. Like trivia with, him. but we we put him on. We put it, but the team, but the categories we have sometimes are so obscure. 
He's like, uh, and what was he talking about today? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm talking about Caspian. What are the ones you fail in every time you go? You walk out of the room and go do something else. Pet the cat. Mm -hmm. What's your? What are your categories you can't do? I don't know. Two thousands pop music. <laughs> Quilting. We had a category in quilting. I don't think you did oh, well on that. I was not totally useless at quilting. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had one answer. Yeah, I'm not any good at pop music either at all. <laughs> we had we had a guy last week. He did pop music lyrics from 2010 or something. But he read the lyrics. But instead of reading the lyrics, he had Alexa read the lyrics. So it was like, <laughs> come on, come on, come on, and party now. <laughs> laughing because he you know he says i don't want to i don't want to give any in indication of what the lyrics really were so i'll have alexa read it and it was so funny but that's that's the kind yeah, of thing yeah. but anyway caspian caspian is a ringer but um we like to trip him up a little bit and have other people other people do categories that are like i love lucy or something and he's like uh, all right. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> That's why we have te it's teams so that yes. somebody or your team knows the answer. Thank you, Cass. Appreciate Thank you it. Very Thank you much. so much. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have to figure out what we're doing next week. Um, that was my okay. seven tell, so I'm done. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was so, so um, cool. Imagine oh, having around in the household. You just sat him down somewhere and you're like, Caspian, I don't understand what's going on with Belarus and all that that's going on. And you just like go, go, explain it. <laughs> and he just goes, okay, well, here's what's happened. Then he goes into the history. Then you're like, and then he goes back a little further. And then he has to explain what's happening in Turkey. Oh, now <laughs> I got to explain what's happening in Russia at that time. But it's really important. I mean, you could spend 50 hours and still be like, oh. price, <laughs> what does this got to do with the price of beans in Egypt? You know, I don't know. And what does he do with all this knowledge? The skills that he has? I should say the skill. He's, he works in Monterey at a, um, he, has, he has a degree, his degree's in. Um, Have you stopped recording, Susan? Oh yeah, I should. Oh. Thank you. He has a degree, where is the darn button in here? Stop recording, yeah. Oh, we were gonna talk about Tamberly, right? <laughs>